Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. My name is Jay Tanner, and today I want to talk about the Dragon Prince. Real quick, my goal right now is to get to 30,000 subscribers by New Year's, so if you enjoy this content, I'd really appreciate if you subscribed. But with that out of the way, let's get into the video. The Dragon Prince is an animated show that premiered on Netflix. It recently wrapped up its fourth season, and overall the show's been pretty solid. Early seasons did have some pretty rough animation, but it looks like that's been corrected. I do wish they had taken the time to smooth that out though. I think it would have been beneficial, because if it feels like they just weren't ready to air it by the time they did. I'm going to be discussing the later seasons in detail, so here's a spoiler warning if you haven't seen The Dragon Prince yet. I definitely recommend the first three seasons, the fourth season not so much. But anyway, here's your spoiler warning. The Dragon Prince takes place in a fantasy world where half of the continent has magic and is populated with magical creatures, and the other half is divided by human kingdoms. Humans were one of the only creatures that were born without the ability to use magic, so they developed dark magic, which involves forcibly taking the magic magic from other creatures, killing them, and so it's called dark magic. I really like the magic system and lore of this world. They put a really unique and interesting spin on dark magic. There are six other sources of magic, which draw from different sources across the environment. These include the sun, moon, stars, sky, earth, and oceans. Although the sun is a star, so I'm not entirely sure how that works, but I guess we're not supposed to think about it too hard. And certain magical creatures, like elves and dragons, correspond to these arcanes. Before the show starts, there was a war between Zadia and the the humans, where the Dragon King was killed and his only egg was smashed, leaving no heir to the Dragon Throne. Zadia wants revenge for this, so they send Moon Shadow Elf assassins to kill the King of Catalus and his heir. However, one of the assassins, Rayla, doesn't actually have the heart to kill anyone, making her a very bad assassin, but that ultimately works out, because they discover that the humans didn't actually destroy the egg, they just took it. So instead of killing the prince, Rayla, Prince Ezrin, and his older half-brother Callum decide to go on an adventure to return the dragon Dragon Prince Egg to where it belongs, in Zadia with his mother, the Dragon Queen. So now Rayla and Ezrin are traveling together despite the fact that she was supposed to kill him, which is a problem for her, because she'll lose her hand if she doesn't, thanks to a magical oath she took before the hit started. But it all works out in the end. This quest encompasses the first three seasons of the show, and even though I feel like the pacing isn't perfect in certain areas, it does do a great job at fleshing out these characters and the world building, to the point where it doesn't feel like it drags even though it spends three seasons on the same arc. Well, on their journey, they discover a lot of interesting things about the world and themselves, like the fact that humans can use magic, there's just a workaround to it, but Callum becomes the first human mage in centuries. The dragon egg eventually hatches into a baby dragon. His name is Ozymandias, called Zim for short, and he's adorable. But on their quest to get Zim home, they're being pursued by Viren. He was the former advisor to the king, but disagreed with his methods. So when the king was killed by the assassins, he tries to usurp the throne from Ezrin, sending his children Claudia and Soren after the princes. Even been telling Soren to kill them. I initially thought Soren would be the comic relief rival to Callum, but he actually really grew on me. As he finds his way out of his father's negative influence and on a more righteous path, Claudia on the other hand is very corrupted. She comes off as having a sweet personality and has absolutely no problem using dark magic, ultimately turning her into a villain while Soren switches sides and he officially joins the group. But really she and Viren are being used by the true big bad of the show, a star-touched elf named Erevos. He was in prison long before before the show starts. Although it's not a very good prison, despite not being able to leave it, he's still able to influence those outside of it, including Viren and later even Callum. But at least he's not completely on the loose. But of course he wants to change that. So the first three seasons was one arc of them trying to get Zim to his mother, while Erevos is trying to manipulate his way back to the outside world. Season four ends up having a two year time skip, which ends up being a bit jarring. I'm not really a fan of time skips because they end up having to rely on telling us what happened instead of showing us. Season 3 ends with them getting Zim to the Dragon Queen, who had been hibernating ever since she lost her husband and Egg, because the pain of it all was too much to bear. But she wakes up to find humans and magical creatures standing together and holding hands, which makes her very hopeful that peace can finally be obtained. All this comes after a very triumphant victory over Viren, after Rayla shoved him off a cliff to their certain deaths, but Callum was able to save her using a new spell. So now it looks like Viren is finally defeated, but it turns out after the season ended, Rayla decided to go off on her own to look for Viren's body, and she even 
even left on Callum's birthday, adding to the drama. So even though we saw things end on a high note, we're now starting off on a low note, without any of the context of how we got here, so we have to be filled in about it. I think this would have been better if they had at least set this up in Season 3's finale, because it's a bit jarring to have such an extreme. I had the same problem with the way they use time skips in Young Justice too. They skip all the setup, throw you into the deep end, and then expect you to be just as invested. Rayla and Callum started dating in Season 3, but now things are awkward between them because Callum is resentful over her leaving, which we didn't get to see. It's understandable why Callum would be so upset with her, although I do feel like he hangs on to that resentment a little too long. Rayla makes it clear that she regrets her decision to leave, and is trying to make it up to him. She gives him space and doesn't expect him to take her back immediately, but I just feel like they spent too much time on this. We waited three years for this season, but everything feels really off, and it's not even just the relationships. The whole season feels like filler, and kind of a waste of screen time. It's called the Mystery of Erebos, but we don't even really find out much, and they made some very strange choices that in my opinion were a mistake. Like there's a serious problem with tonal whiplash. For example, Claudia gets a boyfriend. He's an Earthblood elf named Terry. Of course, how they met and developed their relationship is entirely off screen, but instead they choose to focus on his bodily functions. Apparently Claudia really likes to smell his farts, and they spend a lot of time on this. Meanwhile, she brought her father back to life using dark magic, and the spell only lasts for 30 days, so they don't find a way to make it permanent, he's going to die. And in the same episode, he contemplates just letting the spell run out and just accepting his fate. So there's a huge tonal whiplash, and it's really jarring and really weird. Adding some levity would be fine, but this was just way too far. I was also a little disappointed by Terry and the other Earthblood elves. In the concept art, it shows them being more mystical looking. They have wood grain texture for skin, and foliage growing off their bodies and horns, but that didn't seem to translate into the actual show. In season 3, Callum disguises himself as an Earthblood elf because they're going through elf country and he could be killed if he's discovered, but Callum doesn't actually know anything about Earthblood elves, so he makes up a bunch of silly stuff, like saying trees to meet you as a greeting, but it seems like they actually put that in the show. That's how Terry introduces himself to Viren, and it just feels like they put that in there to reference Callum's jokes, and I think it undermines the Earthblood elves concepts, which was pretty cool. I also think the characters made some very bafflingly bad decisions. Like Claudia knows this spell will only keep him alive for 30 days, and she knows the only way to make it permanent is to find Erebos, but the only way to find Erebos is to awaken this creature in the chrysalis, and the only way to open the chrysalis is to find the staff of Erebos, which is on top of the mountain that Viren fell off of. So you think she'd get the staff first, open up the chrysalis, and then resurrect her dad, but instead she resurrects her dad, expects him to accept everything that's going on, and climb up the mountain that he fell off of, killing him in the first place. Place. So he has multiple panic attacks and she basically just tells him to calm down. And they waste a the whole day. And then in the end, she and Terry just go off without him. It's not like they needed him to be alive for this. Claudia was even able to awaken the chrysalis, so they didn't need him for that either. So why did they waste any of the very short time they have? Meanwhile, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happened between seasons that we didn't get to see. I would have rather they just picked up where season 3 left off. Claudia says she has to do a lot of things to get the spell to work, and it's kind of implied that she killed people. People. That would have been way more interesting to see, but instead they just fart around. Literally. This whole season kind of felt like a waste of time. The hero spent the entire time trying to find where Erebos is, which leads him to a dragon who's supposed to have the information, but they end up not getting the map. So time well spent. There's a lot of farting around in the woods, this time not literally, thankfully, only for them to end up back at square one, but the villains got the map. The only thing that's really notable is that Rayla ends up getting the coins that her parents and mentor were imprisoned in, which is pretty cool. And it was a nice scene where Terry convinces Claudia to give them to her, which was pretty sweet considering the fact that Rayla held a knife to his throat, but he didn't seem to hold it against her. Basically, Rayla held him hostage to get to Claudia and Viren, so Claudia tricked her into thinking she was giving her the coins, but Terry convinced her to give them to her anyway, even though he didn't have to. Another kind of interesting thing that happens is they speak to Erebos through a mirror, and he possesses Callum, but then they kind of breeze past this, and they move on with only Callum bringing it up again, which you'd think would be a concern. Callum seems kind of traumatized by the experience. He tries to talk to Ezrin about it, but he assumes he's talking about relationship drama with Rayla, and then they talk about that instead. So he tries talking to Rayla about it, saying if he ever does become a puppet of Erebos, he wants her to kill him. And I understand why she would be upset by a request like this, but I also feel like she could have handled it better. She basically tells him to stop being dumb, when maybe she could have said like, hey, don't worry, we're gonna be there for you, we're gonna help you and make sure that this doesn't happen, and if it does happen, we're gonna do everything we can to fix it, but that's not really what happens. She 
does reiterate that he's always been a you're in charge of your own destiny kind of guy, but at the same time he's traumatized. Just saying. The last thing I want to talk about is a subplot involving the Sunfire Elves. This subplot was very weak in my opinion. Callum's aunt Amaya is engaged to the Queen of the Sunfire Elves, and they've been dating for two years. But apparently during all that time, they never bothered to learn anything about each other's culture. The Sunfire Elves ended up losing their kingdom, so they're living in a temporary encampment that was designed by a human architect. I'm assuming this was to help soften the relations between humans and elves, but it basically had the opposite effect. The camp is highly flammable, which is kind of a problem considering the fact that these are Sunfire Elves and fire is basically their whole thing, and a lot of their sacred rituals include fire. A major conflict comes up when one of the villagers loses his mother, so he lights a ritual candle to help guide his mother's spirit to the afterlife, but the architect insists on putting it out. But in Sunfire Elf culture, extinguishing the candle would mean damning the soul to roam the earth forever. First of all, I don't understand how this never came up before. It's been two years, and yet they don't have a safe place to practice their rituals. And considering the fact that they lost their kingdom, which probably resulted in a lot of death, plus they have animals with fiery tails that are being housed in wooden pens. Why is this only coming up now? The architect refuses to try to find a solution to this problem, like find a way to save safely contain it and move it out of the camp. Instead, she immediately douses it, which obviously upsets the elves, and they even burn her, and they also want her executed. So this is going well. Amaya doesn't seem to understand the severity of the situation. She makes light of it, saying that fire is just for birthday candles or campfires, but it's been two years she's been dating the queen of the Sunfire Elves, not to mention she's been working closely with them, and yet she seems to be totally oblivious to their culture and doesn't understand why it's escalated to this point. Now the architect is on trial and according to their traditions, she should be executed. And the prince is threatening a coup to overthrow his sister. He's worried his sister's leadership will result in them losing their way of life. But this all feels like it's happening for drama rather than it happening naturally. I can understand if this was happening right after the kingdom fell, but not now. Which is also why I think this season should have picked up at the end of season 3 instead of two years later. There's a point where Amaya asks if they're rushing into marriage. And honestly, yes. It's pretty clear they don't know much about each other. Or their cultures. During the proposal, Amaya attacks the ceremonial dancers because she assumes that they're attacking her, mistaking their fiery ribbons for weapons, and not understanding that these are used for ceremonial dances. It's obvious they still have a lot to work out. Ultimately, in leadership, you do have to put the people first, so maybe right now the queen should step aside from her personal life and focus on her people and their needs, and in the meantime, she and Amaya can come to a better understanding of each other. This just isn't working. Overall, I think season 4 was very disappointing. There was some cool stuff, but a lot of it felt like filler, and there was a lot of it that painted the characters in an unflattering light. But those are my thoughts. What did you guys think? Did you enjoy season 4? What are your thoughts on the Dragon Prince overall? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Before I go, I want to give a shout out to our members. Stutania, Tyrant Carnivore, Adam K, Shiny Orc Boy, The Rabbit Mancer, General Bolivar, Death Charge Media, Samaru163, Gabby Hime, Sandy Martin, Verdant Range, Butcher7 Actual, Dash Hound, JBR, Hussyman42, Nixel, Eric Griffin, Phil C, Taylor Ramirez, Caleb Nelson, Bandito Bane, Hunter Rose, Dakari the Professor, Equestron, Owen Wildish, Norman Sweet Cream, Way Beyond Coincidence, and Garcia XV Legend. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to become a member, you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. We also have a buy me coffee if you want to support us that way. But if you enjoyed this video, you can leave a like and subscribe to the channel, which helps us out a lot too and it's free. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you later. Bye for now.